love my Twitch shirts. People see you wearing a Twitch shirt in public, they're like, oh, are you a streamer? Yes. Yes, I am. And uh, and they're, they're like, wow. What do you do? What game do you play? I play Visual Studio, man. What's Visual Studio? I've never seen that. Is that a Battle Royale game? No, it's not a Battle Royale game. It lets me write code. I build websites. Ooh. Behold the command line wizardry. It's amazing. Try it sometime. You might like it. The program at 34 years old says Suber. Suber Brain. Three years ago, I've been watching this channel too. Then I got a job for six months. And now I just got offered a full-time position at the company. Oh my gosh, Suber. Hello. We got to celebrate that. Congratulations. This is only a test. If this were a real Fritz emergency, you'd be hearing about freaking out and panic. Welcome, Raiders. My name's Jeff, and I'm writing code. I almost think, should I stop the stream? Oh, kids. Look who's here. Wow. Oh, look. Oh, deep out. What the? It's C Sharp Fritz is in the house. Look at that, kids. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Oh my gosh. My name is Jeff Fritz. Um, I go by C Sharp Fritz. You can find me on all of the social medias, all the media platforms, YouTube, Twitch, GitHub, Twitter, Instagram, Byte, Bytes, is that the new one? TikTok, yes. I'm on all the things. Um, and about two years ago, I started writing code live on Twitch. It was a way for me to um, give presentations, continue engaging with folks, having virtual meetup groups, but because I wasn't traveling, because I wasn't going and speaking at conferences, I could do it from the comfort of my own home and present and share what was going on, answer questions, and, and talk to developers. It's a really interesting way for me to kind of reach out and work with other folks. So, um, some quick numbers about what I, where I am right now, what I do. I stream, I produce live interactive video five days a week. That's two to three hours each of those five days. I've already produced, produced more than 300 uh, shows as of January 2019. And I forgot to start recording this. There we go. Uh, we have 700 plus hours of live video out there that I've created over the past two years, roughly. And of note, um, what I've done here as far as live coding and and how we interact with folks on Twitch, I've taken those learnings and helped produce .NET Conf 2018, .NET Conf 2019, Connect. We used to have those in 2018, we had that. And the Visual Studio 2019 launch. These were all ways that we could have folks participate. And in our launches, in these events, and use that same live video interactive chat room approach that is so interesting on Twitch. And I'll show you more about that in a minute here. Um, I like to drop this slide in here because it's, it's, it's not humble bragging, but I want you to see some of the numbers of someone who is, I think, successful with developing and producing content, producing video live on Twitch. So, um, I've produced 357 shows from November 2017 to January 2020. So we're closing in on show 400 here. Um, down here you can see the red line, that's what Twitch considers for their partner status. You need to have viewership, concurrent viewership, above the red line, average concurrent viewership. And as you can see, the green is my max viewers for that month. I'm well over it, my average, average viewer count. Yeah, I dipped down here a little bit but I'm well above doing, doing well there. Um, so average viewers per month, I'm sitting at about 85 average viewers watching at a time. So if you think about having a meetup group, having a conference session, um, 85 people in the room, that's a pretty good number, right? And that's on average. 
Um, I'm, my average maximum as of the end of 2019 is 105, 106 folks, and more than 10,000 live views a month, right? If I were to tell you that I was giving a presentation, right, that I was doing some video work and I was getting more than 10,000 views in a month, that's pretty good. That's a good start. So, um, my stream views are here, the most concurrently watched streams, these two here, July 12th and 19th, I ran eight hour workshops those days, teaching folks how to build with ASP.NET Core and with Blazor. So, to get 2,400 people coming in on something that wasn't advertised, something that we didn't promote, and we just said, hey, this is when this is going to be, tune in and you can learn something. Um, I'm kind of proud of how those numbers are. For an entire conference, those are good numbers. So, um, why Twitch? What's so great about Twitch? What makes Twitch interesting, compelling? What's the thing here that, right, Jeff, why are you even talking to us about Twitch? Well, folks know about this guy. This is Tyler Blevins. He also goes by the name Ninja. And he is the highest paid live video creator in the world. He no longer is on Twitch, actually. We hired him away. He now works for the Microsoft version of this service called Mixer. But he produces and plays games live on Mixer now. But you see he's got a camera here with his name so you can see how he's interacting and playing. And he's got a microphone on his headset. And he's got some other things going on around the outside of the game here. You can see his Discord server. That's kind of like Slack, but for gamers. So you can go in and chat, and there's also a voice component there. So you can talk to your friends while you're playing games. But importantly, there's a chat room here with folks talking to each other about what's going on in the game. He's got, at the time of this screenshot, 13.5 million followers. Now on Twitch, followers are the same as YouTube subscribers, right? Or followers you might have on Twitter, right? Those are people that are just getting notified. Hey, this person sent a message. This person is broadcasting. He's got more than 13.5 million of those people watching, keeping an eye on when things are happening. And his average viewership, if you tuned in over the summer before he switched over to Mixer, he had about 30,000 people that would watch him live at any time of day. There are some television networks that were envious of his numbers, okay? That's, that's pretty impressive. So, um, and there's all kinds of other things going on here next to these people's chat. These little badges here tell you that there's a loyalty badge here. They've been paying money to him so they can watch, and they get this little badge here that indicates how long they've been subscribing and paying him each month. Um, the little crown, that's the Amazon Prime crown, so you know that these people have an Amazon account. They get free shipping and all that stuff on them. Um, and there's other things in here that indicate participation level within the channel. And a big thing that you'll see, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, are the emotes, right? Everybody loves using the emotes on their phone to send messages to folks, or you drop it into Twitter or Facebook. On Twitch, the broadcasters can customize these so that when you do subscribe and you're, and you're paying, you get access to some of these that are special that you can use throughout the network. Really, really great stuff. So Ninja it actually is pretty plain here. This is this more or less looks like you know he's playing the video game and it's his camera over here and it's nothing special. It doesn't look that interesting, except that it's his game with his camera over it. But then there's this guy. This is Doctor Disrespect. Okay, this is a guy who lives in California. His real name is. Blanking on his last name. His first name is Guy. Guy Pierce. It's not Pierce. That's a director. He's got a green screen behind him, just like the folks on television do, right? That broadcast the weather. And he's chroma keyed it out. He's removed it so that he can put his logo up here and embed his game screen here, along with some other information about how you can get in touch with him. So he's literally made the entire thing virtual, except for maybe a quarter of the screen where his game is. And he's got tremendous production values in how he's presenting and showing what he's playing 
on stream. And uh, of course, he's got a goofy wig, he's got a fantastic mustache, and, and the sunglasses because he's, he's playing a character, right? He's being the bad guy, the guy that you love to hate, right? The Deadpool, right? That character that you want to cheer against. But there's all this stuff going on in some of these things that you see are animated and moving, and he's getting people paying him donations that fly in on the screen, show a dollar figure, and then disappear. They're just giving you money for playing. Interesting. But that's not what's really interesting. He's playing Apex Legends in this set of uh, screenshots that I grabbed. Now, when he's actually playing the game, unlike, unlike Ninja, who just had a square of here's where I am, he's chroma keyed out the background, so you can't see what's going on there. You see his chair, but there's a thing in this game in Apex Legends where you can teleport, go through portals, and appear on the other side of the map. So he put a graphic where the chroma key ended that is that portal, so it looks like he's sticking out of the game. And this is a common thing that you'll see throughout Twitch, is folks have green screen, they remove their background. You saw in some of the clips, I've done that from my home, and it makes it more interesting. You're taking up less space, and the game flies by behind you. Or in my case, Visual Studio flies by behind you, because that's important. Now, Tyler might be the highest paid streamer, but what I want you to notice about this screenshot is at the top, he's sponsored by Gillette. He literally has a razor company that's paying him, because he does have a fantastic mustache, to be a part, right? <laughs> to be a part of the broadcast. It's an advertisement that's going in front of 20, 25,000 people at the same time, and it's not costing them anywhere near as much to be on broadcast television, and they know it's going in front of people who love fantastic mustaches. So, that's pretty interesting. That's pretty compelling that he's able to get that kind of sponsorship, that kind of interaction. So, my message to you about that is not go talk to Gillette and they're gonna sponsor your meetup group or whatever you're broadcasting, but the advertisers are paying attention. It's growing up, this streaming service, and folks are starting to get paid to do more presentation. Now, Twitch is by far the number one platform. According to Streamlabs, and that's a company that makes plugins that you can use on top of your video. Um, according to Streamlabs, uh, they issue a report every quarter, and the last report they issued at the end of 2019, there are more than, what is that, 9.7 billion um, hours watched on Twitch in 2019 versus, right, YouTube gaming isn't even a quarter of that, and Mixer, Mixer's not even in the same universe here, okay? But this is, Mixer only has Ninja for a couple months, five, six months, right? It's not completely baked in yet. Now, that 9.7 billion hours watched, that's across how many channels? So a channel is someone like me, broadcasting and showing stuff on Twitch. In Q1 2018, they had 3.6 million broadcasters broadcasting on their channels regularly. And it went up to a high of 5.6 million at the beginning of 2019, and we've seen a slight drop off. Now this is, this could be for many different reasons. Folks do walk away, they, they stop broadcasting, and people start a blog and stop writing blog posts after a week, a month, six months. Same type of thing, folks stop broadcasting. But there's also now the other platforms are coming over. People want to go over to Mixer, people want to go over to YouTube, YouTube Live and broadcast there. So these live interactions are something that folks are tuning into. They want to participate more than just watch a recorded video. So the average concurrent viewer count across all of Twitch, right? The people watching the Twitch platform at the same time, we topped out at 1.1 million concurrent viewers on the platform, and we've dipped down a little bit to 1.04 million. So still, that's a tremendous number of folks that broadcast networks are jealous of. 
That's a lot of advertising you can sell. The average channel, and this is important for folks that are starting up, the average channel gets about 27, 28 viewers concurrently, okay? So that's, that's not bad, and if you go and start a channel, you're not gonna start with 27, 28 viewers right off the bat. It takes time to build up, right? Just like writing a blog, it takes time to build an audience, to build people who are gonna come back and find you. Same thing happens here, okay? I have 100 folks that are average watching me. It took me two years to get there, okay? So let's talk a little bit more about Twitch. Right now, it's mostly gamers and gaming content, okay? And that's fine, but there are also a lot of talk shows, people that are hosting discussions, and they want to hear from the chat room. They want to hear from folks who have similar experiences, have, have some feedback that they can share, and make it a little bit more interesting. In that way, then, it becomes a lot more like, like talk radio, right? Where you're listening in the car, you're listening, walking around, walking the dog or whatever, and you want to call in and participate in the conversation. There is also a lot of creative content like cooking, painting, sewing, crafting. There was a guy, uh, Bob Ross, right? He had a show for years and years and years called The Joy of Painting. And this is a staple on Twitch. It's on 24 hours, reruns of this guy's broadcast. It was on, it was public broadcasting in the States. And it was him just making a painting and talking about his techniques for an hour of how he painted that painting. And it was glorious because he had a nice, calm, soothing voice. And you could watch, and even if you weren't interested in the painting, he'd put you to sleep real nice. <laughs> I loved it. But it's available so you can go and learn. And there's people that are doing cooking shows. Like I said, sewing, crafting. There's even, there's even a, a friend of, that makes chain mail jewelry, right? I mean. All kinds of things out there people are doing, and you can find. There's, in the, in the past year or two, we've seen in real life types of content, where people literally have their camera with them, they have their phone, and they're holding it out, and they're hiking, canoeing, mountain climbing, or even just shopping at the grocery store, and you get to watch what they're doing. Is that compelling? I don't need to watch someone at the grocery store. But to watch someone hiking in a part of the world that I'm not going to, and be able to kind of have that, that experience, that's kind of neat. I, okay, I can buy into that, watch that for a little bit. But I'm not going to go tune in as soon as I hear that it's broken. But what I'm interested in is science and technology content. There's a whole category of science and technology content where folks are, are writing codes, folks are building hardware, You'll see people building, they'll have a breadboard out and they're wiring things up. They're making keyboards. They're building computers live on, on screen so that you can see how it works and participate, ask questions, and learn more about what's happening. Now, anyone can watch Twitch. You don't need an account. You don't need to pay any money. You don't need to do anything except navigate to the appropriate channel and you can watch, okay? There's no gateway to, to enter the platform. If you want to chat, you need to be able to, you need to register as a user. That's easy. No, no cost, no nothing to that. You can set that up. And once you are registered as a user, then you can do those follows. I mentioned the follow account. You can see uh, follow broadcasters, and you'll be notified when they go live. You'll get emails if you'd like. You'll get text messages if you'd like. Uh, push notifications to your phone if you have the app installed, um, and it'll pop up in your browser if you have that activated as well. All kinds of ways so that you know when stuff is happening. Now the next level of participation is subscription. Now I mentioned YouTube subscriptions, right? That's you just click the little bell and you get notified when there's a new video. Well on Twitch, the subscription costs you five, $5 American, and you're paying that to the broadcaster, you get custom emotes, you get some other features, depending on who the broadcaster is, that they will give you, and it removes the ads from that channel. So without paying anything, you're gonna get about 30 seconds to a minute of advertisements before you are able to start watching a channel, but you can remove those ads by subscribing. Okay. Folks, also do an interaction called cheering, where not just chatting, but you can actually 
throw a tip to the broadcaster and they come in a, a currency called bits. So it's one, uh, one penny American is one bit. So you go, you buy a bunch of bits and you're able then to put into the chat room, you know, here's a hundred bits for whatever, right? Hey, you did a great job on the game, here you go. And you'll see that type of thing happen. Um, I have a good compile, I fixed something, hey, here's some bits. That's, that's interesting. There's interactions that we have on Twitch that are beyond just chatting. As a broadcaster, I can host another channel. So what that means is I'm going to syndicate content from this channel over here on mine. All right. So uh, Microsoft has a Visual Studio channel. So I can host the Visual Studio channel. And when I'm not broadcasting, whatever Visual Studio is broadcasting will appear on my channel as well. So I don't have to do anything. I can configure that, and it just automatically sends that content to both places. You can auto-host a channel, which means you set up and you can configure a whole bunch of channels that you want to have the platform watch. And when any one of those channels goes live, then it will automatically start syndicating the first one that goes live. When they stop broadcasting, if you're not broadcasting, it'll pick up whoever else it is and start hosting them as well and get that syndication happening. I used the word raid in the one clip at the beginning. When you raid a channel, right, if you play, if you play games like World of Warcraft, right, there's this concept of raid where we as a group, we're going to go and we're going to plunder, you know, this, uh, this dungeon, this area of the map. Well, in Twitch, we're going to take all of our viewers and we're going to plunder, we're going to raid that channel, and everybody's going to go over to that other channel. We're going to automatically start hosting that other channel, and everybody that was watching my channel is going to go over there and appear in their chat room. So it's a way to hand off viewership that I'm signing off. I'm done my broadcast. Here, let's all go watch the Visual Studio channel. And everybody goes over there all at the same time. And it ends up being it ends up being a big surprise to the other broadcaster because they don't know what's coming. And just all of a sudden, here's 200 people. There you go. They're watching you now, and you weren't expecting that. So some folks um, get a little intimidated when they see a raid come in. There are, um, we want to be able to moderate our chat room, so you have moderators. They have a little sword icon that appears next to those folks. Um, they're allowed to ban other chatters. They're able to time out or remove messages from the chat room that might not be appropriate for your, for your channel. And lastly, we have a, a thing that was just released within the last nine months to uh, Twitch folks, where you can recognize, um, you can recognize important people in the chat room with a diamond icon and call them VIPs, a very important person, and they'll get that recognition. So when they show up in chat, oh, that's somebody who's important. Okay. We know they get certain, um, certain services, certain features that are turned on for them. So as a broadcaster, anyone can broadcast. You don't need to pay Twitch a thing to start broadcasting on their platform. That's pretty big, just like YouTube. You, where YouTube, you can send recorded videos over there and they'll start recording, uh, publishing that, making it available for people to watch. Twitch, anyone can broadcast. Save copies of, and, and Twitch will save copies of the broadcast. Um, and I mentioned Twitch will run ads to cover their costs. And as you become more prolific, a broadcaster, you get different statuses. So after, uh, I have the numbers for it, but after you reach what they call affiliate status, you then start receiving payment for those cheers and subscriptions. You don't get that when you just start streaming. And you also get transcoding, right? Transcoding is when I'm broadcasting at 1080p here, I'm broadcasting at high definition video, well, it'll automatically scale down for those folks that don't have appropriate connections to be able to receive that information. Finally, there's what they call partner status. And partner is the highest level of uh, interaction that you can have, that, of recognition, I'm sorry, you can have from the Twitch platform. Um, you get more emotes, you get custom, you can control when ads run 
and you get what they call custom chair modes. Not just the, the bits appear, there's a couple of different little pictures you can choose for them, but I can now make my own chairs that people can throw. So to become a Twitch affiliate and actually start getting paid from the platform, you need to accomplish these things. You need to average three viewers. No problem, we saw the average number of viewers is 27. So as long as you're not doing something stupid, you should be able to get three viewers. It's gonna take a little bit of time to get there, but you need to average at least three viewers and stream on seven different days. So you can't start in the next day, start getting paid for being on Twitch. You need to broadcast for at least a week, okay? And I have seen people who in their first seven days reached affiliate status. But, at least seven different days, eight hours total, you need to cross that and get 50 followers. So, the, the commentary that I make about Twitch is that I see Twitch as a social network. Where Twitter, you're broadcasting at 280 characters a message, you're broadcasting at high def video on Twitch. If you have social media followers over here on Twitter or Facebook, and you bring them with you to Twitch, you can get that 50 followers real easy. Now, partner. Partner is harder. You need to average 75 viewers over a month, 30 days. So you can't just have a, a, a show where, you know what, only 10 people showed up. You need to have 75 people watching you for an entire month. So effectively hosting a conference session for 30 days. Stream on at least 12 different days of that 30 days and a total of at least 25 hours. So running a conference session with 75 people in the room for 25 hours is not trivial. But that's what it takes to get to this partner status. Now, once you're at partner, you get cool little emotes that you can share. These are some of the default emotes that you get over here on the left that folks like to use all over the place on the platform. And some of these have different meanings in, in the Twitch subculture. Um, so, right, I mean, the smiley's up top. Okay, that's cool. And salt is when people are getting angry, right? So you drop some salt on the phones. The Minecraft creeper. You've got the orc from uh, Warcraft. The dog, you've got a crying face here. Different things that you can reference that mean different things on the platform. And of note is, is this little black and white guy here. Um, that was one of the programmers for the original platform, but it's called Kappa. And this is the sarcasm indicator on Twitch. So you don't just write, oh, that was a really great, that was a really great play you had there, Kappa. And it's not sarcastic, because you draw that guy's face on the end of it. And it's those little cultural things that you see happening on Twitch. These are custom emotes for a friend of mine who goes by the name Shadow Fox. And her, her nickname is Shadow Fox, so of course all of her emotes are these bright, cheery, happy foxes that anybody who subscribes and pays her for $5, you can use all of these things to talk and express different feelings throughout the, um, the platform. Um, the last four foxes here, they've got different color scarves because they're from the four different Harry Potter houses. I was like, okay, that's, that's pretty cool that you integrated that because that's your thing. So, on my, on my channel, I have emotes like this. Because I liked, I liked the .NET bot, but the .NET bot is .NET's thing. I wanted my own bot. So I, I took the antenna off the top of him, and I've got this little guy now, and these are the ones that you get when you subscribe to me. And I've got the, the C-sharp sloth here, and I, got, I, I took the, the, the GitHub Octocat, and, and I've got a thing for coloring my beard. I do. So we put a rainbow beard on him in a purple hat. Uh, did the same thing with Clippy from Office. Um, and uh, this is Gritty from the my local uh, ice hockey team, the Philadelphia Flyers. Um, and of course the Super C-sharp logo. I want to make sure that was in there. So people get to use these when they subscribe to my channel. Okay, that's nice. But Jeff, why should I start broadcasting? What's what's in it for me? I mean, great, I can get paid. I can. Why would I do this? Well, look. 
when you have that rich chat over there, there's also extensions that occur inside of uh, the, the Twitch screen, just below the video, that give you different ways you can interact with the broadcaster. And it means that you, as a broadcaster, can get some really cool feedback. You can work on projects together with those folks that are watching you, and maybe even broadcast your user group meeting, your, your meetups, so that other folks from outside of your geography can participate. Yeah, there you go, virtual meetups or user groups. And we've done that from our studios on uh, Redmond campus in Seattle, Washington. We can have all kinds of people watch and see what's going on from Microsoft. We get to reach customers in the community, in the community with a medium similar to talk radio. That, that's big. That, that is so big to be able to have that rich interaction. Um, it, of course, you get feedback, you could get paid, and uh, everybody wants to be internet famous, right? Mm -hmm. So I asked a friend of mine, um, her name is Misty Turner, and she goes by the handle Imperial. Um, and she was playing Sims one day, and I asked her, why should folks get involved, get interested in if streaming? If I had some advice to give to new streamers, what would I tell them? I would tell them... to understand why they're streaming. Are you streaming for fame and fortune? Are you streaming because broadcasting is fun for you and sharing a little piece of your day with the greater world, whether it be one person or one thousand people, is something that brings you joy. Um, figure out why you're doing things and you gain your motivation from that. And realize that streaming, like, is more akin to acting than it is to any other job, in that success is very difficult to come by. Now, somebody at that time subscribed and she has an alert that pops up and it's it's Kylo Ren, her handle is Imperial, like Star Wars Imperial. And here's Kylo Ren saluting this person who subscribed. So she's a single mother in Denver, Colorado, and she has hundreds of people watching her during the day while her kids are at school, she broadcasts. And she might be doing sewing, she might be playing The Sims, but folks are hanging out with, here's another mother that looks like looks like them, that they're able to participate and interact with and have discussions and, and she's very non-confrontational. She's welcoming. Join us. Let's have fun. Let's talk together. Let's play some games and watch and have a good time. So if this, if this feels right to you, what do you need to get started? Well, some hardware to get started broadcasting. Everybody's going to need hardware, right? You're going to want a PC capable of broadcasting your desktop, camera, and microphone. So the, the minimum that Twitch suggests is an i7 with an NVIDIA 960 and 16 gig of RAM. You can get away with less, but for a minimum quality broadcast, get your hands on that. Now I run with an i7 7700 at home, a GeForce 1060 card with six gig of uh, video memory on there and 32 gig of RAM on my desktop at home. Um, we'll talk more about this machine that I use when I'm on the road. This is an Intel NUC that has an i7-8800 in it, uh, 8800 in it. Uh, 32 gig of RAM, uh, half terabyte hard drive, and it has a 16 gig ATI video card in here. So a lot of flexibility on what you can choose, and certainly this is a very small device that you can pick up in here. Um, I, you need to have a good USB microphone. Sound is important with this. If you have bad sound, it doesn't matter what you're showing, nobody can hear you, right? So I recommend a good USB microphone, a Rode Podcaster, a Blue Yeti, a Snowball. You may have a headset that you use for Skype or Teams or, or Zoom. Whatever it is that you're using for chat, that's probably good enough as well. You should have a webcam. People engage with you better when they can see you. So a good HD webcam is going to go a long way. And don't use the webcam built into your laptop. You're going to run into problems with it because it's right. It's the cheesy little one that whoever built your laptop decided to put in there. The one on this laptop, this Lenovo Yoga, the camera's actually on the bottom of the bezel because you can turn it inside out. So when you turn the laptop inside out, it's actually on the top and it's 
I've used a Logitech 920 as my webcam, and I've also, I currently use a Razer Keo as one of the two cameras that I use when I broadcast. Um, software that you need to start broadcasting, that's easy. OBS, you'll hear people talk about this all the time, open broadcaster software, and we're using it right now on that machine over there to record what we're broadcasting. OBS, you can find at obsproject.com, and it gives you the ability to compose scenes, put together screenshots, video capture from one window into what it is that you're uh, attempting to broadcast. It gives you all the stuff to wire up and transmit to Twitch. Really great stuff. There's another version um, that the folks at Streamlabs, that's a company that, that builds different, uh, different widgets and things that you can use with Twitch, with Mixer, with YouTube. They put together their version of OBS because it's free and open source, and it adds those overlays and widgets that they make directly into the software. Or there's a commercial piece of software called XSplit that folks use. Uh, it's commercial grade, has production ready features, it's Windows only, but it's also, it's not free. You have to, you have to go and buy that, and it's also not cheap. So, that gets you started, and once you start broadcasting, Twitch's platform will capture uh, video at 30 or 60 frames a second. I recommend people broadcast between 3,000 and 6,000 kilobits per second. That'll get you good quality picture being transmitted. Audio is encoded at H.264, so you're gonna get CD, uh, at least CD, if not DVD quality audio being broadcast, and you can broadcast for a maximum of 48 hours before Twitch will boot you off and you have to reconnect and restart. That's kind of a safety feature because there were people who were broadcasting for like an entire weekend, and they weren't doing too well after. So they, health-wise, they're looking out for the streamers and they said, after 48 hours, you got to disconnect here, friends. Okay, that makes sense. So this is what, this is a screenshot from my first broadcast. And it looks terrible, but it, it was my first broadcast. I, had, I grabbed the video from my screen from uh, Visual Studio, put it over here. Uh, my webcam that was there on, uh, it was a Logitech 920. So I put that here, I had four people watching, and these are people that just started following me. The first folks to start following my channel were being reported here, and I put my twi uh, Twitter information and my website up at the top, and I felt really cool. Look at me, I'm broadcasting, I got, I got my Doctor Strange hat on, my Beats headphones, I'm doing great. But when I look at this as a broadcaster now, I'm thinking, oh my lord, it's hideous because there's so much more you can do with this besides just put your camera here, put your screen over here, because we can do more interactions. We can make some of this content more interactive. Some of that starts with better hardware. So I started adding more features within six months of, of starting streaming because I fell in love with the platform. It's something that really spoke to me to be able to get folks chatting with me and building projects together even getting pull requests from folks live on stream. So I started putting in lights. I got some soft lighting that helped to help the camera to give me um, better better resolution, better lighting on me. So I didn't look like I was, look at this. I look like I'm in a dungeon over here with the way the shadows are here before. And that's just from my desk lamp that was there on my desk. So I wanted to get new lights. I wanted to improve my sound, a better headset so I can hear the entire mix and in a boom arm for my microphone, so I can get the microphone closer to me, so I'm not, I'm not reaching out to, to go speak to the microphone that's sitting on my desk, right? Or, you know, if I had a headset microphone, that's, that's pretty good too. Uh, and I introduced a green screen, just like I saw Dr. Disrespect have. I wanted to remove my background so I could see inside my production. So I bought a green screen, and it literally sits right behind my chair, it's clipped up at the top there. That's a, it's a photography stand in the back that you would uh, typically use to mount box lighting, but instead it's holding a clip up with my green screen. And I went and got some RGB LED lights, right? So these are LED lights and I can set whatever color I want on those. So my lights that are in front of me cast these really ugly shadows you can see on 
the green screen. That's not going to look right when the computer sees that and goes to remove the green. So I use these LEDs to fill in that green with green light so that I get a nice even green behind me and it looks good on the camera. So now, after applying those things in about, in about three to six months later, my stream started looking like this, where I would embed my chat over here on the side so I could see everything that's going on and folks could interact and that would be available on the recordings. And I could see here's the latest actions from folks, but the background's gone from behind me and I'm sitting inside my browser. Isn't that cool? You know what, the first time you do that, you realize that you can literally reach out and touch GitHub. That's kind of neat. <laughs> it's kind of fun, right? Um, and I, I, was, I had 118 followers, and I promised, you know what, if we get to 500 followers, you know, we'll have this little gauge up at the top. If we can get to 500 followers, I'm going to give you the ASP.NET Core workshop that people pay you to give at, at different shows, Dev Intersection, Bill, whatever. I'll do that live on stream. So I also had, I put a little gauge up here where I noted I had 17 people watching on Twitch and I had 11 people watching on Mixer because I was broadcasting to both platforms at the same time using a service called Restream. I don't recommend people do that only because you can't see across the two services. So the folks that are here with the Twitch logo are only talking to people on Twitch and the folks with the Mixer logo are only talking to the folks from Mixer and you can't see across from one platform to the other when you're chatting. So you end up with a divided community with two different sets of conversations going on. And if you thought trying to program and hold a conversation with someone was difficult, try holding a programming and holding a conversation with two different groups of people. That's crazy. So I started getting more invested after that point. I started building and going and getting more hardware. So I, went, I, I originally had lights that I, I literally bought at the hardware store and I had pointed at the wall so it would reflect back on me. Well, I went and purchased what are called Elgato key lights. The name of the company is Elgato and these are lights that have a Wi-Fi access point in them and you can programmatically remotely control their temperature their brightness and have them synced up to each other so that they all turn the same color, they all turn the same brightness at the same time. So it gave me a lot more control and it had a diffuser in front of it so it was nice soft light on me instead of that harsh light that I, you saw in the first where it was just my desk lamp. I also installed a dedicated sound mixing board so I felt like a real sound engineer. So I got a Mackie FX8 sound board and I got an Audio Technica AT2020 compressor microphone. It gives me a much richer, much warmer sound when you hear me talk and broadcast over that because there is no digitizing going on between that microphone all the way through the soundboard. Once it gets through the soundboard and it gets processed, then it's digitized and put into the PC. But it's at the last minute, right? It's not being, it's not digitally coming off of my voice. So you end up with a better range of sound. I also installed acoustic panels in my home office to soundproof. And that just kind of made sense. I was thinking, why didn't I put in acoustic sound panels when I started working from home? Because I was hearing the, the, the wife in the next room over because that's the bedroom and she's doing watching TV, she's doing laundry, whatever in the bedroom, and I can hear her through the wall or the kids are down the hall in their bedrooms and they're playing and doing whatever and I can hear them. I don't want to hear them when I'm broadcasting and you don't want to hear my kids when you're watching my stream. So I put in acoustic panels and I put in, here's my soundboard. And it looks kind of crazy. If you're not used to seeing a soundboard, uh, a sound mixer, it, it can be a little intimidating. But the first row here is my audio technical microphone. It's plugged in with what's called an XLR connection. And I have, here's my high, medium, and low, the treble, the mid, and the bass. And I can set those independently for each one of my inputs across the top of this. Um, output over to my monitor, right? I have a separate audio out that I send here. That's my monitor. I send that to my PC, separate from the USB connection that comes off the back. So I actually am producing two different soundtracks off of one device. I have my PC audio coming in here, and I can do the same thing, setting my treble, my mid, and my bass right here. 
determine where I'm sending it out to, right? This is going out to the monitor. Well, this is coming in from the PC. This is going out to the PC. So I better not be sending whatever sound effects are coming off my machine back to the PC. So that's muted, turned all the way down. And this is pulled down so you can't hear it while I'm broadcasting. All of these sliders are what's going out to, uh, to the broadcast, to OBS. So I have my monitor global here, that is how loud it is uh, on the PC. My headphones here are plugged in, and I can hear what's going out the mix of these things. Okay. So I have an immediate uh, and, a, and a very accepted sound engineer's way to handle all of my sound that's being, being generated for my stream. Um, additionally, I have some sound effects that come as part of this board. Um, different echo sound effects that I can turn on here with a dial that lets me set different things there. I don't typically use that anymore. Actually, I have a piece of software that does this. So, if you're if you're into sound, this kind of makes sense. But it's and it's also easy to pick up if you're not into it. It's easy to get in and get started. <coughs> There's my acoustic panels that are installed above. There's the top of my monitor, and they, they go all the way up to the ceiling, and they go all the way back and forth on the one wall. I've been thinking about putting them on the door, but I feel like that's just too big. The, the wife acceptance factor of putting foam panels on the back of the door is not great. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I have those installed, and I chose. I, the, it's blue and gray. You can have them be whatever color you'd like. Uh, I like the blue and gray. That's kind of mine. My preferred set of colors. Well, with after all that installed, now my stream looked like this. Now I've got some. Uh, look at that. Look nice, realistic colors around my face. My Captain Marvel hat on there, and I've dropped out the background. I've got a really cool studio microphone. Um, I put some numbers here. All the numbers that were across the top, I put down here. So you can see here's how many people are viewing on Twitch, how many followers I had. And I started putting this in here. We started doing things with artificial intelligence on Azure around sentiment analysis. So wouldn't it be great if we knew the sentiment of the chat room as they typed their messages? Because if people start writing in the chat room, Jeff, this is kind of boring, why are you doing this? You know, can we move on? Let's get to the next topic. It'd be nice if I had a way to pick up without actually reading everything that they're saying. If I could respond more quickly to that, that'd be pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So the smiley face, it also turns into a frown, is the relative sentiment of the most recent messages that Azure reviewed. The 72 is the sentiment percentage over the last five minutes. Uh, the last minute, I'm sorry. So 72% happy. The higher, the more happier they are, the lower, the angrier, the sadder they are. And the arrow is a comparison of the five minute sentiment to the last minute sentiment. So we know which way is it trending, up or down. So here's the thing. I'm going to give you, the, here's the secret. I watch that arrow. When that arrow changes and it starts going up, I'm doing something good. When it flips and it's going down, mm, change topic. They're not, they're not too into this. Or take a look and read a little bit further into the chat room and make sure, make sure things are going well. So I've got an immediate indicator of how do I need to interact with the chat room before I even have to actually read anything. Here's the most recent things that have happened on the channel. Um, some followers, someone cheered some bits. This person cheered a lot of bits and they, they, they cheered again. And they have this thing that you'll see on a lot of channels where it's, it's a tip cup. It's literally a picture of a glass that the service provides. And as people cheer, those bits are literal images and bits, and they get dropped into the tip cup as though you were playing piano at the bar, right? Or you were the bartender, and you see change go into the tip cup. Same thing's happening here. And for a while, I, was, I had folks say, hey, can you put a tip cup out there? And they would fill up the cup. Um, and I, I also have a place here for images, for things of different events that are coming up or uh, different products that I wanted to make sure folks knew about. So. I have my GitHub image here at the time. And I, I put a crawl across the top so you can see, here's the people that have been participating in my projects that I work on on stream. So you can see and learn a little bit more about who are the important people that have participated. It's a way to put folks' names up there so that they get recognized 
on video, on stream, as helping the community. Easy. I don't have to do anything. That's data being mined from GitHub. There's one thing that I've learned about being a streamer. It's getting things set up, get everything set up ahead of time, and then get lazy about it. Automate everything. Because everything can be automated. And then you can focus on delivering your content. So that was one thing, how I broadcast at home. You can step it up a notch, and here, this is us broadcasting at, well, it's not really the tree houses on Microsoft campus. This is actually inside of um, Channel 9 Studios at Microsoft. They've got a real full studio there, 4K cameras, right? Really high quality stuff and a green screen that was behind us. So I pulled out the green screen and I put a picture that I found of the Microsoft tree houses. So it looks like we're sitting outside the tree houses at seven in the morning and it's bright as the middle of the afternoon. And, and that's my friend Allison and we're talking about cool things in Visual Studio on our laptops and enjoying a cup of tea. And easy, simple. Now I mentioned there's kind of a thing about me coloring my beard. You saw it on the intro slide. This was the first time that I dyed my beard. So in, in summer, I want to say 2018, um, I had one of those challenges like you saw for the ASP.NET workshop. And somebody said to me, it'd be kind of funny if you dyed your beard. I'm like, what, where the heck did that come from? Why would anybody dye their beard? That is the craziest, silliest thing. <laughs> do people actually do that? And they sent me pictures of these gentlemen who had some very nicely groomed beards, and they were dyed rainbow, vertically. I thought, okay, you know what, let's make this really hard to reach. If we hit some number of followers, I forget, 7,000 followers, before Ignite, I will dye my beard for Ignite. And they completely missed it. We didn't get there. And then I said, well, if we get to 7,500 before Dev Intersection, which was three months later, I'll dye my beard for Dev Intersection. And they missed that too. But in January, they hit it. And they said, oh, you got to dye your beard. I'm like, all right, fine. I'm going to Microsoft next week. I'll dye my beard. And I got to campus, and the other folks that I work with were so excited because they're like, you're going to dye your beard. I'm like, uh, yeah, OK. Can we help? Sure. So we found a phone room, a little closet in one of the buildings, and I sat back on a chair like it was, like I was at, at the hairdresser, at the, at the barber shop, and they put a towel over my face and they just started going down and coloring my beard. Now it's only three colors, it's purple, orange, and blue there, but it was the first one. We got it right. And, and it, was, it was fun and people said, you gotta do more of this. And then the purple beard happened. And then rainbow again. And I'm not going to name any names, but somebody wanted me to wear a pink beard this week for sweet time. <laughs> this was the next thing that I did to kind of step up my game. And th this is the secret sauce. This is the magic that gets your hands off the keyboard from touching, touching uh, OBS. Because when you look at OBS, and it, when we get done here, I'll let you see how things are set up here. There's all these little lines and things you have to mouse over to click. So what we have is the Stream Deck. And this is a set of 15 buttons that you can program. These are all, right, these are uh, LED screens? LED, LCD screens. You can put whatever image you like on it, and you can wire it up to fire macros, to interact with applications and do different things. So what I've done with mine is I have them programmed with all the different scenes, all the different ways that I want my stream to be presented. So when I want to change from, from a full camera of just me to Visual Studio in the background and I'm off to the side, I can press a button and change scene. Now I run two of these because I'm a little crazy. Um, I have on one of them, I'll have my background music, I'll have my OBS scenes, but on the other, I load it up with sound effects so that I can drop in a sad tuba, I can drop in sad trombone, I can drop in uh, audience clapping, folks cheering, I can drop in dude where's my car and the guys saying and then to each other. There's 12 different and thens in that movie. I've got six of them um, because the other six were lame. Um, there's, there's all kinds, of, I have buttons so it says Scott, and there's all kinds of different ways that they said great Scott in Back to the Future. 
through the three movies, there were 24 different ways that he said it. I'm using four of them. Um, and they used it in um, Rocky Horror Picture Show. There were three or four different ways that they said Dr. Scott. I only grabbed two of those because the other two, there was too much background noise. But I've got these all wired up and I can use them at the push of a button. Now that makes things a little bit more interesting. That makes it sound a little bit more like what you might hear on the radio and it sounds more realistic, it sounds more fun. There's things you can do there, right? And I've, I've leaned into this in how I produce my stream, and so much so that um, Wired Magazine interviewed me in September of 2019, and they called me the shock jock of developer video. Okay, that's a little, little bit out there, but it was fun. But I, I actually use, I use two of these when I'm on the road, so I end up with 30 buttons, uh, they make two different other size ones. There's one that only has six buttons, but we're developers. Spend the money and get at least 15. Six <laughs> buttons is too few. Um, and, but I have one of those because I actually wrote a piece of software that helps control this. And so I have the six and I've got the two with the 15. And for Christmas this year, I said, you know what? I'm going to get me the XL. So they make one that has 32 buttons on it. It's really big. And I've got it loaded up with sound effects, and that one's sitting next to it. And so I've got, I literally have uh, 30 and, uh, I've literally got 70 keys sitting there in front of me that are programmed. I've got more keys on these things than I do on my keyboard. That's saying something. And there's menus and folders you can drill down into in each one of these. It's all completely customizable. So much you can do with this to control not just OBS or play music or play sound effects, but those key lights I mentioned, where you can programmably control the lights, I can press a button and turn my lights on and off, or dim them all from here, instead of having to find the appropriate app, open it, and hit a slider, or something like that. It's already on a button. Press the button, all the lights go on. I have another button set up where I can press the button, and it launches all of the apps to start my stream. Another one will actually start broadcasting. Another one will stop broadcasting. So I have all of this set up so that I don't need to go find the button in the right app. It's literally right in front of me on a key. With an appropriate image that I remember and makes sense to me. So, OBS, I mentioned it's this thing that you use to broadcast. What's involved there? Well, video broadcast can kind of get a little crazy, so let's make sure we get some terms down that we understand first. A scene in OBS is a video layout that's going to be broadcast, right? It's the entire layout that's going to be going to appear in that 1080p, 720 uh, resolution video that you're transmitting. A source is that audio or video component that's part of the scene. So a scene is made up of sources. You then have a mixer. You have a mixer that controls your audio composition, right? What level, what volume level do we want? My microphone, my sounds coming off of, my sound effects on the stream deck, my music that I'm playing in the background. I need to control and set all of those appropriately, otherwise you're not going to be able to hear me over the music playing in the background. And you can also configure transitions, that short video that plays when changing scenes, right? You, may, you can have dissolve effects, wipe effects that you're used to seeing on television, you can control and build your own transitions if you'd like as well. There are all kinds of sources that you can select and set up inside of OBS. Not just audio input and output captures. You can actually capture a web browser. You can capture your various displays, the different displays you have connected to your PC. Grab an image and embed that right in there. Um, uh, they call it a media source, but that's really a movie, an MP4. You want to point to and say, play this in this area of the screen. You can do that. You can actually embed one scene in, inside of another scene. We're developers. So composing things like that, that kind of makes sense to us. So if you have a scene over here that you can reuse in other scenes, I don't need to copy and paste the positioning of everything in all those other places. I can just say, well, here's the positioning where I want this group of things and include it everywhere else. You can hard code text in there. You can capture from some sort of a video device. So that might be a camera. That might be a capture card. Now, I'm actually using my capture card tonight to record on the machine over here. But this is the capture card I'm using, okay? 
It's about the size of a deck of cards. This is from that same company, Elgato, again, a loyal customer. This is the HD60S. It will capture at high definition resolution, 1920 by 1080 at 60 frames a second, and it's connected with a USB, uh, it's a USB-C to USB-A connection, uh, USB-3 compatible. Going from here to over there, it takes my HDMI in from my PC and turns it into the USB going into my capture machine. Out the other side here, I have a pass-through. So whatever's being broadcast here, and I'm capturing and sending over there, is being passed through without any changes, a little bit of signal boost, coming out the other side, and in our case tonight, it's going through a projector. But that's how I'm capturing and using the video that you're gonna see on the recording later, um, is through this video capture device, the HD60S here. And of course, you can tell OBS to capture just one window on the screen. Um, for my camera, I need to mention the other capture I use. I have a camera, literally. It's a 35 millimeter camera. This is what I use for some of the scenes, but most of the scene that I use at home. This is a Sony Alpha 6000, okay? It's a DSLR, digital SLR camera. There's no mirrors in here. And this will output micro HDMI. Well, I can take micro HDMI, run it through to another Elgato capture card. This one is designed for cameras. It's called the CamLink 4000, and it takes in the one side HDMI, and out the other side is USB-A. It's actually USB 3 compatible so that you get high-speed 4K video coming in, and it makes this into a webcam. Not bad for just a cable that I'm hooking up to a, a regular 35, well, what would be a 35 millimeter DSLR camera. So when I start composing these things, it looks like this. Now you've got the infinity effect here because I took a screenshot while I was showing OBS, so I'm seeing OBS inside of itself. But you get your preview that you see up top. This is how everything looks. I have my scenes down the side here, so I can select one of these, and it has many sources. So I, and you can name the sources and scenes, whatever you'd like, so that it makes sense to you. And here's my sound mixer. So for this scene, code, chroma key with stream elements, I have this audio setup and these sources. So my audio mixer that you saw earlier is down here. I'm bringing in it using that. I have my wallpaper in the background that looks like the matrix, right? The letters and numbers going down. I have that here. And this is top to bottom how they're being layered as well. So display two, that's the display that I'm capturing. I have three displays hooked up to my machine. This is display two, the middle of this one. Um, the rainbow beard goal is actually hit. Uh, no, it's there. No, it's not. Oh, gosh. Um, there's a gray bar down the side where I show chat in this case. There's my camera is the webcam. I have a filter I applied to that that chroma keys out and moves the green. Well, I turned off the filter so you can see this. Uh, my events over here, my name plate that appears here. These are all the pieces. This is actually a video here that's being played because my name rotates out, disappears, and different addresses appear. And these are different pieces of browsers that are being shown that have my number of followers and my number of Twitch viewers in the sentiment, okay? They're being updated live. I know how to write web pages that update live. I write something like SignalR. I'm a .NET developer. I know how to do that. Well, if you write a web page that has SignalR that updates live being pushed from the server, you can capture that web page and embed it inside of Oh, yes. And that's what I did. It's just pushing down and updating every so many seconds when the value changes. So the mixer kind of makes sense. The various volume levels, things are muted, unmuted, so you can see what's going on. And over here, I have my controls. Start streaming with the top button. Turns into stop streaming when it's actively streaming. Start recording or stop recording, same thing. Studio mode will actually take this preview up at the top and turn it into a... Um, uh, production and preview screens. So you can see here's what's being currently pushed out. 
and here's what's another few so you can kind of queue up the next scene you'll be able to work with those settings you can control the settings of it and exit down here these are important this footer it's amazing how important this footer is and it's so small down here you end up staring at it squinting to try and read it this is how long you've been live this is how long you've been recording how much cpu you're using and how many frames per second you're showing if you're broadcasting a flag will appear here that's green yellow orange or red that shows the quality of your connection it's green when you have a great connection all the way down to red when you have a bad connection and you're not actually transmitting so it shows you that transmission level that's a little bit about how obs looks and works there's a lot more to it about how these things get placed and activated you can show and hide things by clicking the eyeball you can lock them down so they don't move by clicking the lock all kinds of things you can do but the the nickel tour is what we just discussed there's different ways to interact with people on stream i mentioned uh stream elements and different ways to embed browser things in there so we can embed we can do different things that folks can interact with. You saw that, that announcement pop up on Imperial's video where uh, there was a subscription that was announced. Well, you can have those widgets that pop up and announce these things that happen. It's a browser source. I mentioned it's a web page that you embed. It, it appears like a Chromium web browser, but we drop out the background and it appears directly wherever you place it. Whatever is on that web page is what appears on screen. So if we use SignalR, if we use, uh, oh, what's the Node.js? Uh, what's it? The web sockets, but Node.js has another one that lives on top of that. Socket.io. Socket.io, thank you. Yes, you can use Socket.io to push and update content on those pages, and it just looks, looks fantastic uh, that it's being updated live with your video. So there's services out there that you can use that will configure this, make it, make it look nice for you. So I started adding some of these. I added this little alert down here that um, it's Steve Ballmer announcing that we've got a new developer, 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 and we put that person's name here, and we say they're now following, and folks think that's pretty cool that here's Steve Ballmer chanting developers, 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 with my name when they first joined the channel. But here's the thing, and I learned this the hard way. People's names aren't always the most friendly in every language. <laughs> So I started having um, some folks who were racist coming through and they were, they, they had some names that were racist in non-English languages and they were clicking through so that it would pop up on screen. So I had to remove it and it now just says, thank you for following. And it no longer has their name because I was being, was being trolled. It's not, it's not cool, but this is what we deal with when you have all of the internet invited to watch your stream. So there's a bunch of folks that provide these widgets. I mentioned Streamlabs, they produce that report that we saw earlier. They make individual widgets that can be configured. Um, and they have a website out there at streamlabs.com. You go out there and you configure your settings I want. They give you a web page address. You grab that address, copy it in as a browser source inside of OBS, and it appears in a little square wherever you'd like. Move it around and it interacts, you can interact with it easily. And you can manage these directly if you use that, that Streamlabs OBS, which has the unfortunate English acronym of SLOBS. I, I, don't, I don't know if they realized that when they first named it, but okay. Um, the other service that I currently use is called Stream Elements. Stream Elements, you have widgets that you add to custom layouts inside so you have an entire layout an entire screen you can work with and you place the widgets on there and you then get an address for that entire layout and you add that layout into OBS and finally there's a uh, an application that a friend of mine good friend of mine um, wrote called Gifbot and Gifbot is a Windows uh, Windows Forms application that has WPF in there already for us as .NET developers I'm like ooh, okay I know what that is but it will play GIFs, it'll play MP4s, wherever you'd like on screen. The, it has two windows that appear. One's a control window for you as an administrator, and another one is a green screen. It's literally a green window that you capture, and wherever you placed those GIFs, those movies, 
they'll appear in that location on there and you capture that green screen, remove the green, and that's what you put on screen. So Streamlabs looks like this when you're editing. So I've got this nice editor here, and I've placed a, a purple bar at the top of mine here with a little bit of gradient, so it looks like it's got a little bit of a curve there. I'm, I'm not an artist. Um, I put some icons here so you know that YouTube, GitHub, Twitter, I am C-Sharp Fritz, and I have my, uh, my face. I was appearing over here, but now I'm, I'm over here. Um, I've got a little gold bar that I've built here, so if we get to this many followers, we'll have a 12-hour 12-hour uh, party online. That's something folks are looking forward to. Here's an indicator for who was the last person that cheered and how much they cheered. Who was the last person that subscribed? Yes, it's Blazer Mr. Magoo. That's the thing. Um, this is called Capogen. And you might see this happen when folks cheer and do different things on my stream. When people uh, drop emotes in the chat, whatever emotes you put in there, will fly up in this section of the screen because I put this widget here. And if someone subscribes in this area for this capogen over here, a, a fountain of my emotes will be thrown at my face because this is where my camera is. So it's ways for folks to interact and, and it looks kind of funny when those things happen. And I configured all this online on Streamlabs and I grabbed the URL for this layout and embed it in OBS. The advantage of that is then, when I want to change this layout, I want to move something, I want to take this and move it over, change that number, I don't have to go out somewhere else, do something in OBS, I can actually move this, change this on the website, and it updates automatically inside of OBS for me. Fantastic. I, don't have to, I can actually hand that off to a producer and let them do that for me. So that's how Stream elements work. Stream labs, you can't really see how it works, that kind of thing online. But GIFBot, GIFBot is .NET. GIFBot produces and puts video content and plays music for you over your, your presentation. This is Fierce Kittens, and she's demonstrating the latest feature she added to GIFBot. Okay, because this is what happens with, with a thousand bits. So someone cheers a thousand bits, $10 American. She likes ice cream. I defy you to be serious when you can do things like this. Okay? There's a lot you can do. Don't take yourself too seriously. But then, that's how we configure how we broadcast. How do we configure Twitch so that we're sending stuff there and we've got a nice environment for folks on the platform for us to interact with? This is the wall that's below my video. It's from a, almost a year ago now. Uh, I took this screenshot. But I've got these different panels, they call them with a little bit of a header and some text or an image with some text underneath of it. And it talks about the different things, you know, here's some information about me, here's my schedule coming up, here's a group that I belong to, the store if you want to get my face on the t-shirt or something, my, my GitHub projects, rules that you must abide by if you're going to participate in our community. Um, if I reach 7,000 followers by May 1st, Jeff will dye his beard rainbow colors for live stream sessions at Microsoft Build. Oh, why would I promise to do that? And a link to Visual Studio, because everybody needs Visual Studio. Okay, so that's how, right, this was always on my page, so people could always discover and work with that, but how do you actually configure these things? Oh, and this is, this is the live coder. We'll talk about those in a minute. When you click Edit, this is what it looks like. These are really easy, and I purposely made it hard for you to read some of these things because it doesn't matter what it says for the purposes of this discussion. But each one of these has, has a little title. You can put one image into it that goes to 320 pixels wide. You can have that image link somewhere. You can put a web address here that you want it to click through, and some sort of text you could have up here below. Now, I had mentioned earlier about extensions that you have on Twitch. 
These are panel extensions that you see here that do something more than just text in the images. So this one shows the schedule of when my next stream is. And this one shows my stream team, the live coders. And over here, this one shows uh, the other GitHub projects that I manage and work with. So that when people say, hey, where can I get the source code for something? We'll just click the GitHub project in the box below. Real easy. Easy for me to point out. And I've got configure buttons so I can configure these additional features. And people have built all kinds of ways that you can interact from these panels with their channel. But for me, when I'm broadcasting code, I want you to be able to see my GitHub projects. Now, this is what the control panel used to look like when you broadcast. I should have updated this and I didn't. They recently changed this so that it, it looks a little bit different, but all the features are pretty much the same here. You, you have your stream information, what's the title of my current broadcast? What does it look like when I send a notification out to people that are watching? Let's write some code with Jeff. And I have a category that I participate in. That Twitch wants us as folks that are producing code, that are talking about technology, to participate in the science and technology category. And that helps people discover your channel. You have tags, the different things that are a little bit of information about your channel. Um, I'm broadcasting in English. I'm talking about software development, programming, web development. It's an educational stream. AMA, ask me anything and we'll answer that. Um, I didn't control this one. They just threw it on there that it's IRL. It's, I'm not doing anything in real life. It, it is me, but okay. And it is somewhat creative. It's not a game that I'm playing. Um, and some stats when I'm broadcasting these fill in with the number of people that are currently watching. How long I've been broadcasting. How many clips people make. Because people can say, hey, that was fun. Let me clip that. And it'll save that clip, that little bit of video on Twitch's servers so that you can go back and watch it later. And all of the video that you've seen tonight that I presented from Twitch, those are clips that folks have created on various channels. Um, this is where the chat room would appear. This is where I'm rating and hosting information about the other streamers that are going on. So I wasn't broadcasting while I took this screenshot, but I was hosting uh, this woman who goes by the handle Ellie Face. So I can search for another channel and click rate and start rating them if I was broadcasting, or I can say start hosting, start syndicating their channel with this panel. I can run ads because I'm a partner, I get this panel, and I can rebroadcast, I can schedule reruns down here. So that's kind of cool to be able to rerun video on my channel. I mentioned the Live Coders. The Live Coders is an organization of folks that are what we call a stream team on Twitch. They're people that work together that if we were if we were gamers, we play the game together. We all play the same basketball game. We all play the same football game, right? Whatever. You you're you collaborate. You're a you're a team. But we don't really have teams as developers. We collaborate, we work together on similar projects. So what what several of us talked about and decided to do was let's have a team of developers that write code together and we work on projects together, and we have each other on our channels. So we created the Live Coders team with a, with a bunch of folks on it, and at the time of this screenshot, we only had 24 members. Ha <laughs> ha! We also had a cheesy, floppy disk logo. <laughs> um, we commissioned uh, an artist, we had this logo made, uh, we had jerseys made, we had, we had a sponsor come on, and now there's 120 of us. And these are people that are talking about all different kinds of technical topics. They're broadcasting at every hour of the day. They might be in Europe, they might be in America, they might be in South America, Australia, they might be in Japan, Thailand, all over the place. And they're broadcasting in all kinds of different languages. And it's all about getting technology education and learning in front of everybody. It's free, it's easy. Go to this website, livecoders.dev, You'll see the list of folks that are currently broadcasting and who else is in the team. You can click through, learn more about them, and watch all on one window. And this is Talk to Me Guzman. This is, his name is Eric Guzman, and he's coding with Ruby in Visual Studio Code and looking up stuff on Stack Overflow to help him with this project. It's, it's easy to get involved, and we want to encourage more people to participate and work together. So let's wrap up and talk about some keys for success. 
And some of these are going to sound familiar if you've, if you've blogged, if you've done anything uh, with any type of content production. We want to have a consistent schedule. When, when Game of Thrones was on, you knew when it was being broadcast. It was must-see TV. Oh my gosh, what's going to happen with Khaleesi this week? You tuned in because you knew when Game of Thrones was. They didn't have to advertise it. You knew it was coming. So if people know when you're broadcasting, they're going to tune in. So I was only broadcasting Sunday and Tuesday of this week, but I broadcast five days a week, and people know. Tune in at 4 p.m. Stockholm time, and I can catch Jeff, right? 10 a.m. East Coast, United States time, and they can watch Jeff. Start slow. Work your way into this. It takes time to build an audience. Make recordings of your videos available, because if you're only broadcasting for two to four hours, there's a huge part of the world that might be asleep, might be at work, not able to watch your content. If you make your recordings available, they can time shift and watch you when you're not broadcasting. It's very important to try and improve your discoverability of your channel. This is a big one that people don't understand. Look at the camera. If I'm not giving a pre if I'm here, I'm giving a presentation to you. If I'm giving a presentation the whole time like this, what the heck are you doing, Jeff? Look at the camera. The camera's your friend. Nobody's on the other side of that. It's literally a piece of metal sitting there. Who cares? It's not intimidating. Look at it. Smile. Be welcoming and inviting. Because when people are watching you, they're watching on their laptop. They're watching on their phone. They have headphones on. They're this close to your face. It's a very intimate level of presentation. The medium is just like you're sitting across the table from your friend. Talk to the folks like they're your friend. Because you know what? With how close they are, they better be your friend. It's, it's okay, right? Some other keys to success. You are an entertainer. People aren't just watching you to learn. They want to have fun. So have a good time with them. And bring your friends. Talk to them. The, the people that are in your community, in your chat room, they want to be a part of something. They want to see you su succeed. So bring your friends. Talk to them. Smile. Have a good time. And make sure you interact with them. If you don't talk to them at all, they're not going to watch you. They're not going to ask questions. They're not going to participate. Talk to them. Hey, chat room, what do you think of that? That was really cool what just happened there. Or, you know what? There's a bug here or something. Did anybody see what's going on there? I'm not quite sure what happened. And if they can see something in your code that you're writing, they might be able to help out. Bad audio can kill a broadcast. This happened to me literally Sunday night this week. I was trying to broadcast from my hotel room, and every third word, I got a little 10 millisecond pop in my audio. It's hard to understand what's going on. Okay? I reset things, and it came back, and my audio was just fine. Bad lighting, and if viewers can forgive that. You can turn off your camera if need be. But if they can't understand what you're saying, they can't participate, they don't know what's going on. This is the biggest one for me and the one that I'm most passionate about. Everyone is always welcome on Twitch. It is the most inclusive and welcoming community I've seen anywhere, okay? People talk about how 4chan is such a terrible place to be and there are nasty people there and you, the chat rooms, the forums there are just mean and nasty. Everybody on Twitch is always welcome. I don't care what language you speak, I don't care what faith you are, I don't care what color this, your skin is, uh, I don't care your sexual preference, I don't care your gender that you declare you are or you're born. Everybody is welcome. It doesn't matter if you have no hair, if you have brown hair, if you have gray hair, if you have blue hair. Everybody is welcome. Welcome them as such. They're going to have a good time together. They're just text on the screen. Enjoy it. Have a good time with them. All right? My name is Jeff Fritz. This worked on my machine, so I was shipped. You can find me at all these places.